Thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction. I, like Susan, also want to thank my coworkers back home who are helping to cover for me so I can be here today. You never know, there might be a case on a Saturday and call is always something that needs covered. Many of you in the audience know me, and for those of you who don't, I've been a perfusionist almost 20 years, and I've been a nurse for almost 15 years. And I'm here to talk to you today about a passion of mine, and that passion is safety. Safety in cardiac surgery in general, but safety in perfusion specifically. I'm an employee of Warren Clinical Analytics. I'm so grateful for that relationship that allows me to think about safety and perfusion every day. And so in February of 1937, a Douglas Aircraft Company DC-3, similar to the one pictured here, and operated by United Airlines, took off from the airport in Burbank, California, headed for San Francisco. The DC-3 was the latest and greatest aircraft of its generation. It had all the newest safety features, had just rolled off the production line two years earlier, it was basically brand new. Despite all that, this DC-3, as it was headed to San Francisco, crashed into the bay and killed 11 people. Now in the ensuing investigation, it was discovered that the co-pilot, during the approach to landing, had dropped his mic on the cockpit floor. Because of the design of the control column and how it went through the cockpit floor, the microphone became wedged in the gap. This made it impossible to control the plane's elevator. It locked the plane into a downward glide that it could not pull out of, ultimately leading to that fatal crash. Now for its part, the Douglas Aircraft Company immediately recalled the DC-3. They redesigned the cockpit floor and they redesigned the control column. But we have to ask ourselves why. Why did no one see this event coming? The pilots, the aircraft maintenance crew, especially the engineers who designed the plane. Why did no one see this event coming? It's because they did not have the information they needed to operate safely. And so from this incident, aviation learned that some things can be difficult and maybe impossible to predict. And that's a lesson we need to think about in perfusion. But I also wonder sometimes if we don't lean on that lesson as a crutch. Sometimes maybe we say something's one in a million or one in 10 million, it'll never happen again. And sometimes that could be true, but maybe it's not always that way. Aviation learned another lesson in the future that I think we also need to consider. This time we go to December, 1974. TWA Flight 514 is on its way to Washington, D.C., and it's just after lunchtime. In D.C., there's very high winds. And so as a result, 514 is rerouted over to Dulles International about 30 miles away. In Dulles, however, the skies are cloudy. And as 514 gets closer, there's some miscommunication with air traffic control about the instructions for landing. This miscommunication results in 514 plowing into the side of Mount Weather, killing all 92 people on board. This time during the investigation, a pilot from another airline testified to the National Transportation and Safety Board that he had experienced the exact same miscommunication six weeks earlier, and it almost resulted in the crash of his aircraft as well. And in fact, further testimony revealed that this was at least the third known occurrence of this event happening. Near miss, near miss, catastrophe. And each pilot had reported this event to their airline, but there was no system to collect and distribute that information among all those who needed to know. The FAA realized at this point that the information needed to operate safely didn't lie in the hands of an airline CEO and it didn't lie in the hands of an airport manager. That information was out there 
in little bits, in little pockets throughout the industry with pilots, with air traffic controllers, with aircraft maintenance crew. And the FAA realized it needed a way to collect that information and distribute it back out to the people who need it, the frontline people who need it to operate safely day to day. And so partially as a result of this revelation, in 1975, the FAA created the Aviation Safety Reporting System. The ASRS is an independent third-party organization. It collects anonymous reports about safety events in aviation, puts them past experienced personnel, and redistributes that information back out to stakeholders, to the frontline people who need it to operate safely. Now, I'm going to change tax here. I want you all to conduct a thought experiment with me. I'm going to provide to everyone in this room an all expenses paid trip to the tropical destination of your dreams. Okay? The only catch is, you name the destination, Bora Bora, Hawaii, somewhere in the Caribbean. The only catch is, to go on this trip, you will have to fly on an airline that is not subject to National Transportation and Safety Board investigations. This airline is not beholden to the Federal Aviation Administration and is not required to abide by FAA airworthiness directives. Finally, the pilots on this airline, they don't report safety, safety instances into the aviation safety reporting system, nor do they read the reports that come out of the aviation safety reporting system. Now, you might not know what any of that means, but it doesn't sound good and it doesn't sound safe. And most of you, and probably all of you, would reject this flight, even if it was free. You see, safety is table stakes in aviation. It's the cost to play the game. And even if you don't know how an NTSB investigation works, and even if you don't know what an airworthiness directive is, you as a layperson can surmise this airline does not have the information it needs to operate safely and you would be right. And that, my friends, is where we are in Perfusion right now. We are that unsafe airline, and we do not have the information we need to operate safely. And every day, we ask our patients to fly with us. Now, just like 514, we in aviation, uh, we in Perfusion have had our own repeating errors. Case in point, Jack published this article in 2011, a frightening account of a massive air embolism in a Fontan patient. Robert Groom was editor of Jack at the time, and he was shocked when after publishing this article, Jack received multiple letters to the editor outlining near identical incidences at other facilities across the country. This was supposed to be a novel case report but as it turns out, it wasn't. Just like aviation prior to 1975, there was no system to capture the information needed to operate safely and put it back out to the frontline people who needed it. Case reports like this are both rare and difficult. They're rare, obviously, because of the fear of litigation, but they're also difficult because, quite frankly, who wants the worst day of their professional career to be a peer-reviewed article? Now, because of the rarity, articles like this can't do a lot to educate our practice. We can take little bits of information away from them. But as a whole, we can't build our practice around articles like this. But what articles like this can do is show us how far we have to go to build safety into perfusion. This is a graph of safety in U.S. aviation from 1958 to almost present day. And in this graph, safety is, me is measured as deaths per million departures. Now, during this time, that number fell from 38 to less than 
That is a 98% reduction in accidents. Now, how did aviation achieve this? Many of us might say that, well, they've had advances in technology, and that, of course, is true. During that period of time, they've had significant advances in technology. But I would say to you, and probably most of you out there know, that during this period of time, we in Perfusion have had massive advances in technology, and we've had nowhere near a 98% reduction in accidents. I'm sure all of you would guess at that intuitively. Now, when we look at this graph, a lot of us might like to think that we're somewhere on the right-hand side of the graph, down where safety events are low. But I would say to you that published literature indicates that where we really are is somewhere on the far left side of the graph, up where safety events are still relatively common. That difference, that 98% reduction in accidents is a patient safety gap that we are looking to fill. So how do we do that? Well, we look back at aviation and say, what did they do during this period of time that allowed them to make these massive advances in safety? And as it turns out, if you study aviation during that time, they have achieved and implemented three major variables. These variables, I call them the holy grail of safety data. Now, during the first two years of that graph, 1958 to 1960, Every jet aircraft in the United States was equipped with cockpit voice recorders and flight data recorders, primarily to assist with accident investigation. Second, during the 1970s, pilots for the very first time ever were put through simulations that were based on actual data collected when planes used those, the cockpit voice recorders and flight data recorders and flew through weather phenomenon, specifically microburst in this case. And finally, as I said earlier, in 1975, the FAA implemented the Aviation Safety Reporting System to anonymously collect, analyze, and distribute the safety information needed to operate. <clears throat> I call these three the holy grail, as I said. And to recap, they're real-time data capture, data-driven simulation design, an anonymous collection, analysis, and distribution of the data. In perfusion, in our history as a profession, we have not made any major advances on these three holy grail metrics since the beginning of our profession. So how can we do it? How can we, as cardiac surgery teams, perfusionists, nurses, surgeons, how can we use these tools to improve safety in perfusion? Well, as it turns out, that's exactly the problem my colleagues and I have been working on for the last three years. We have been working on this, and how we did it, the information is available in a white paper on our website. And further, more granular detail is in a manuscript we have submitted to JECT. I hope it's published maybe late summer or early fall. But to make a long story short, we combed the literature. We searched hundreds of articles. We spoke to perfusionists, really hundreds of perfusionists, and I spoke at this very meeting two years ago on the topic. And when we summarized what we had found, we realized that there were eight critical components that perfusionists wanted in an incident reporting system, a system that would function similar to the aviation safety reporting system. And once we had these eight components, we got to work building a system that would meet all of the expectations perfusionists had. Now that work was completed in April of 2021 when the Orem PSO was officially listed with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Orem PSO is the only cardiac surgery, perfusion, and ECMO-centric patient safety organization in the world. A thorough outline of how patient safety organizations work, their legal and technical components, is beyond the scope of my talk here today. But I will say to you briefly that our official listing status means that we can confidentially, anonymously, and securely collect incident reports from perfusionists, physicians, nurses, really anyone involved in cardiac surgery. 
We can collect reports on sentinel events, on near misses, on equipment malfunctions. And we can collect those reports from anywhere across the country. Everything submitted to the ORM PSO is confidential and privileged forever, protected by the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act of 2005. Those protections, those are nationwide and uniform. The sole purpose of patient safety organizations is to improve safety and quality in healthcare. This is our reporting platform, perfusionsafety.com. You can go to this website from any desktop, laptop, mobile device, and here you can submit an anonymous and confidential report. There's many fields on here to get detail, but we wanna make it simple. Only four of those fields are required. If you have a simple event you'd like to report, should take you less than five minutes. If you have something complicated, you wanna put in a lot of detail, you can take all day, that's fine. But this is open to anyone. There's room to leave return contact information that is not required. If you leave it, that contact information is confidential and privileged, and we will return to you a complete analysis of your event free of charge. This is a brief outline of the workflow when you submit an event to the ORM PSO through perfusionsafety.com. What we do is first, we collect reports from all across the country, from hospitals, from individual providers, and we bring them into that PSO legal structure so that they're confidential, privileged, and protected. We collect like reports together, and then we analyze them. We have experienced clinicians using the best tools available. Those, that analysis comes into play when one event reports an oxygenator issue, we can look at every other event that has reported an oxygenator issue to look for similarities. Finally, once we've extracted all of the learning out of those reports, we distribute that information back out to the frontline providers, to the people who need it to operate safely. Of course, I'm a big fan of AMSECT. Thank you, Susan, for mentioning the safety committee. I think we all should be big fans of AMSECT. And this is a, a little bit of a teaser announcement, but there'll be an official uh, email going out later in May. But we have signed an agreement with AMSECT, and the ORM PSO will be the official incident reporting system of AMSECT. So for all of you who are AMSECT members, I encourage you to watch for that email later on. We are very excited to be working closely with the AMSEC Safety Committee and the AMSEC Quality Committee in working to build and improve care for perfusion patients around the world. And we've been a listed PSO for about one year, and we've been collecting reports for approximately 10 months. And this is where we stand. I think our results speak for themselves. So far, we've analyzed 46, 46 unique event reports, and we have about another dozen awaiting complete analysis. We have 189 participating facilities, and we've put 175 perfusionists through PSO-protected simulation trainings. Now, I don't want to beleaguer this point, but I think it's, it's important to note those PSO-protected simulations are ones that the perfusionists can participate in without fear that their performance will come back to bite them. Because as being part of the confidential and privileged nature of the patient safety organization, those simulations cannot be audited. They can never be pulled into a lawsuit. Finally, the number that I think here is most telling is 11. In 10 months, we have generated 11 novel suggestions for best practice. Those are suggestions that are not present in the AMSEC standards and guidelines, and they're not present in any of the international guidelines, at least the ones I'm aware of. And this means for our members, and this means for you, 11 major opportunities to increase safety and decrease risk in your practice in less than one year. Now, colleagues, I think that we are at a crossroads in our profession. 
and I think that we are going to have to decide where we want to go. And this is my favorite part of the talk because I get to use two terms that I like, and that's what if and imagine. Now, what if in 1958, the FAA made the use of these Holy Grail safety metrics optional? What if some airlines in 1958 installed cockpit voice recorders and flight data recorders, and some did not? Imagine that these airlines, they, they put their pilots through data-driven simulations, and these airlines did not. And finally, imagine that the pilots in these airlines, they reported safety events to the ASRS, and when the reports came out, they read them, they understood them, and these pilots did not. I think I can suggest to you, but I think you know already, the safety record in those two airlines would be so substantially different that no one would fly these non-participating airlines at any price. As we established earlier, safety is table stakes in aviation, and it should be table stakes in perfusion and in healthcare as well. So I want you to imagine what these tools and what this information could do for your practice. Imagine that every quarter you receive a report from the Orem PSO that have, has recommendations for best, best practice and that as you implemented those recommendations, every quarter you became just a little less likely to have a serious safety event happen at your facility. Imagine if those changes aggregated and accrued over time so that in two or five or eight years, the risk profile of surgery at your facility was substantially lower than another nearby facility. You will have filled that patient safety gap that we talk about. Imagine next year at this time, you're participating in a simulation, a PSO protected simulation, one that's not based on the mechanical limitations of the simulator and not based on some piece of textbook knowledge that someone pulled out but based on actual second-by-second second data that was captured as another perfusionist went through some rare event. How could that change your practice? Now, finally, imagine that in 18 or 24 months, you're operating your heart-lung machine with a clinical decision support engine that is built based on the complete analysis of hundreds of rare reports, rare events that happen, and all of the data captured during that. It would be like doing your case with hundreds of experienced perfusionists just behind you, all ready to help you catch that rare event, maybe before you could see it on your own, and offering suggestions for mitigation so that you did not have to reinvent a de novo solution in the middle of a crisis. All of these things become possible for the very first time using a PSO protected incident reporting system like the Orem PSO. Now, I'd like to ask you to join me. Join me in these 189 other facilities in helping to make the future a better place. If you'd like a copy of our white paper, you don't have to write a long email to me. You can email me at this email address and just put white paper in the subject line. And I'll be happy to send that back out to you. If you'd like to talk more about how you can become a member of the Orem PSO, you can also send an email at this email address and just put meeting or talk in the subject line and I'll be happy to get back to you. Now, I've used a lot of uh, analogies to aviation today, and I think they're all applicable, but this will be my final one. When I ask you to help us make the future a better place, I want you to help us make the future a better place for our patients. Our patients trust us just like passengers on an airline. They trust us to not let the small stuff slide, to take safety as seriously as we can. I know that you as a member of a cardiac surgical team are under an enormous amount of scrutiny. And to use these tools 
it doesn't matter if you're hospital or contract based. It doesn't matter if you're pediatric or, or adult. We at the Orem PSO, we don't endorse staffing solutions. We don't endorse pumps. We don't endorse disposable supplies. We only endorse knowledge. And our sole purpose is to get to you the information you need to operate safely. And now for the very first time, that is possible. Thank you.